chapter 5, uh, the, verse 18, if you've been reading ahead of our study in 1 Thessalonians, you know that the Apostle Paul writes, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now this morning, we want to give you that opportunity to give thanks. We're going to give thanks as we celebrate with two people that are being baptized this morning. We're going to give thanks as we sing our praise to God. We're going to give thanks as we hear individuals share their praise to God. And later on in the service, you'll have the opportunity to share something that you're thankful for. We'll have a, uh, we'll kind of divide the church in half, uh, have a, a microphone down one side of the church and have people on one side to share what they're thankful for. And then a couple songs later, we'll switch sides and have folks on the other side share what they're thankful for. We're also we're going to look at uh, Psalm 138 this morning. That is a psalm of thanksgiving that talks about why we should be thankful and what we should be thankful for. And then we're going to end the service by giving thanks as someone joins our fellowship uh, by coming into membership. So let's uh, pray together as we begin our uh, time of worship today. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together to give thanks to you, to praise you for who you are and for what you've done. Father, we pray that this would not only be a meaningful service to us, but we pray that it would honor you, that you would be glorified by all that takes place. And so we commit it to you in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to begin this morning with baptism. And in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And that's what the baptism pictures, as the two individuals are baptized this morning, when they go down into the water, it pictures the idea of being buried with Christ, dying with Christ. And as they come up out of the water, and we always do that, we haven't lost anybody yet, when they come up out of the water, it's the idea of resurrection, of coming back to live new life in Christ. And so this morning, uh, we're going to have the privilege of hearing the testimonies of Marshall Crock and Joyce Amuda. We'll hear their testimonies. They'll be on video on the screen, and then we'll have the privilege of baptizing Marshall and Joyce this morning. So listen to their testimonies. My name is Marshall, and Jesus Christ is my Savior. What made you... What kind of happened that you said, I want to believe in Jesus as Savior? When I was a little kid, when I was a little kid, I was in Sunday school. I just went for church my whole entire life. I started to understand like all the miracles that God did. Being able to create stuff in itself. Like, saying something and it happens is a miracle. Like how he could raise someone from the dead, make someone unwind. It's just amazing to me that how he can do it. God can do it like that. We can't. Because you believe in Jesus, how do you live your life? I live my life trying to live like you said. I try to, to, I try to live how Jesus Christ did. He serves other people, like he takes care of people, and he always speaks the truth. He never lies. We we've talked about that. Me and him having a conversation probably over the last <clears throat> month. I think he kind of it was actually through uh, that Bible. Um, Robin Bob Tom kids. We've been reading a story every single night, like at dinner. Well, yeah, we're almost done with it, but like, you got to go on a baptism. Like, well, I've never been baptized. You start asking a bunch of questions about it, so I'm like, all right, let's go for it. And why do you want to be baptized? 
I want to show my confession that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I want to do what Jesus did. He got baptized. So I want to get baptized. And I want to get baptized because Jesus wants me to. If you could tell somebody one thing about Jesus, what would you tell them? He's important to me because he created me, he loves me, he, he takes care of me. My name is Marshall and I have the size of Jesus. My name is Joyce Samuga. My life before Jesus. So before I wasn't, I was not really like a fully believer. And I would go to church just because my parents wanted uh, us to grow into like the church. But I was not a fully believer because I had been to so many different churches and I, I could not understand anything the pastors were saying. And you would go in and people would start sleeping because it was just too long and you don't get anything. So you go to church, but if somebody asks you, what did you learn from church? There's nothing. Um, that was when the missionaries started coming to preach. And that's when I started understanding little by little. And I was like, I need to change my life. I need to start believing. They were teaching it. They were kind of like breaking everything down and make it, making it easy to understand. It was, um, the way they explained was simple and understandable way, even the other pastors. That's when I started um, taking pieces and putting them together and knowing, oh, this is what a Christian should be. This is what, this is what it means to be a Christian. How, how has following Jesus changed your life? It has made me realize which one is the right path and which one is the wrong path. Like, um, like I'm a teenager at this age, there's so many deceiving things in high school, even in life in general, between friends. And ever since I, I, I put myself in Jesus and trust in Jesus, I've learned to be patient, to live, to live my life to the fullest, and uh, to go into the right, the right path and not follow what my other peers are doing. And uh, putting my trust in God has made me realize which path to follow. I don't want to be a Christian just by name. I want to be like, like in God's family and I want people to know that I'm a Christian. I want to be baptized because I want people to know that I'm, I'm not just a Christian by name. I want to follow Jesus. My name is Joyce and Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. So Marshall, you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and you know your sins are forgiven? Yes. And you want to be baptized to uh, let other people know that you're a Christian as well, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Because of your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. your grandson. My Father God Almighty, what a privilege and prayer it is to be here today to witness Marshall's decision to live and to follow you all the days of his life. We thank you, Lord God, for the cross and for his meaning and that all can come to us. And I just pray today, Father God, that if anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, that this would be the time that they make that decision. 
pray for Michael, Father God, he's such a wonderful little boy, and then we love him very much, our whole family and the church family. And I just pray, Father God, that each day he will keep his eyes fixed on Jesus and Jesus alone, that he will grow in his faith, that he will mature, that he will be faithful to attend services and uh, Sunday school. I pray, Father God, that he would read his Bible, that he would pray daily to you, that he would completely surrender all he had. I pray, Father God, that he would be a light in this darkened world, that he would go out unafraid and proclaim Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I pray, Father God, that we as a church family will pray for him daily, that, will, that we would help him in any way that we can. I pray, Father God, that, that Michael would just become more and more of Jesus Christ each day. And uh, I just, just pray that he would just continue to love you and walk each day with his faith in you. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks and praise always and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, Joyce's testimony, and uh, Joyce, you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Yes. And you're confident that uh, your sins are forgiven. Yes. And you want to be baptized today to let people know that you follow Jesus. Yes. Well, because of your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. stand, we'll, uh, we're going to read a little scripture and we're going to read a little Lord in uh, Psalm 105, 1 through 3 says this, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And that's what we're going to do right now, we're going to rejoice. <laughs>
provision. I wanted to let you know that despite Joseph being laid off and my hours at work being cut, that God has continued to provide. Despite moving my mom in and having kids home all day to feed, including an ever-hungry <coughs> teenager, we have had more than we need. Despite Joseph going on active duty, needing to wait a month for the military to start paying him, we have not gone without. Every bill has been paid in full on time. 
It was a particular instance several months ago when I was sitting down to write our weekly check for the offering in the same usual amount. I felt the Lord saying to me, double the amount. I hesitated, but again felt that nudge to double the amount, and so I wrote the check. Within just a few days of that, Joseph and I received a completely unexpected check from an uncle of his, who he rarely has communication with. It was out of the blue, and the amount he sent was five times the amount I wrote that offering check for. And since I sent that email, God has continued to provide day after day, month after month. Even just this past week when our refrigerator died unexpectedly, God not only provided the funds for replacement one, but he has gifted us with great friends who show up at our door with coolers and ice so our food won't spoil. As Jesus said in one of my favorite scriptures, therefore do not worry, saying what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things, after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. going to be walking around with a microphone, and I think we're going to do the, the right side, my right side, or left side. We're going to do the right side of the church first. If anyone has a testimony or something they would like to share about how God has worked or how God has blessed you or something you want to thank God and praise Him for, um, now's the time to slip up your hand and Doug will come with the, um, with the, with the wireless mic and uh, you, can, you can share that with us. My name is Michelle. I happen to be Dave's mom. And I am so grateful to be here to see Marshall get baptized, to see my son leading worship, and just so thankful for Kelly coming into his life because if Kelly hadn't come into his life, me and my husband wouldn't be saved. My daughter may not have been saved, and David may not have been saved. And I'm just so blessed to have a son that loves the Lord and loves his children unconditionally. Amen. Hi, my name is Jean Tebow. Um, my husband and I have been uh, coming here for just a uh, little over two years, and um, I just want to thank God for his general health, because my health has kind of like been up and down, and I've had um, many challenges. Um, I've been praying really a lot um, um, because of all the difficulties, you know, that our um, country has been going through, and um, uh, but I'm not going to go all into like all the details and stuff, because I'm sure that um, everybody knows um, a lot of, um, you know, what's going on with our, our, our country. Uh, I just want to thank God for um, his, his people, because just by what's going on today, um, I haven't, um, I didn't come last week, and I haven't really been keeping up with what's going on. But this is a true witness as to what our, our um, what God wants us to do. Um, he said in the um, end of Matthew to go and make disciples and, and to tell others about um, about the Lord and about salvation. Um, it, it's um, the second. Um, it's a covenant. I mean, the, the, um, I, I've been reading the Bible from from uh, Genesis. This would be like the fourth time I've gone through the Bible, and now I'm I'm in the um, Book of Romans. And uh, the book of Acts kind of like reminded me of how much the Jews um, um, just did not care to hear about um, the new covenant that Jesus brought and, and um, about the explanation that um, Paul brought about um, to um, the people. Um, and, and it was so just so clear. And, and um, he was so sorry about like, the things that he had done 
in the past and then his eyes were open. So um, Jesus sent him to you know, the rest of the world. And if it wasn't for all that, we wouldn't even be here. Um, so I just want to thank God just for life and, and just for his spirit to be able to like speak into us and to be able to like go forth because our church is kind of like, um, you know, you know, all of this, our space is here. Um, when we first came, you know, like we were kind of crowded and everything, but because of the virus and stuff and then, you know, our own fears about like catching germs from each other, I mean, flu season, you know. Um, but then we get this other bug that, you know, um, has come. Um, and, and they're trying to, like, we're relying upon science to help us. But then we're, God has also given us common sense, too. Um, but when our, our, the point that I want to bring across is that God has given us Jesus into our own lives to kind of go forth. Um, because the world is breaking apart. And, and there's other signs, you know, that um, he's coming back. Um, so we're in that deep um, fight. Um, so I'm just so thankful that, you know, he does speak through us to others. Um, so that um, even young ones and um, old people or people in between you know, can come to him. And, and then the, it just kind of like the simple message about being baptized. I mean, I mean you know, it, it's silliness to the general world. They don't understand it, but once the light goes on, in your head and understand what it is, you want to go forth through it. So I just praise God for that. So thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to thank God today for um, how he keeps me in line. It's through his word and through friends. And I have um, a dear friend who's going through a, a lot financially, health-wise, relationship-wise. I mean, she's really, it's really hard to watch for me. And um, she has such faith and love and trust that God is in control. She encourages me to not complain and not be negative and not be self-absorbed in myself when she's struggling so much. And I'm thankful for those around me that encourage me. Well, I'm thankful that I have Joyce back in our lives. Um, we are going to Florida on Friday and we're taking her with us for a week because she's studying online, which makes it really convenient. And um, so I said, well, when we're down there, you know, how should I introduce you? Are you just like my friend or what? And then I said, why don't I say that you're my adopted granddaughter and you can say I'm your, grand, your, your adopted grandmother. And she goes, well, that's okay, but what if they ask for the paperwork? <laughs> songs and um, after we sing these next two songs we're going to move the mic over to the other side and if anyone from the balcony would like to come down after um, you're more than welcome to as well but let's uh let's read first we're going to read psalm 106 i'm going to read verses one through three out of that where it says praise the lord oh give thanks to the lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever who can utter the mighty deeds of the lord or declare all his praise blessed are those who observe justice who do righteousness at all times the second verse there, who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Um, yeah, we definitely can't do that, but I, I, I think we're, we're going to give it a good shot right here, right? Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
praise or, or thanks. Good morning. I want to quote the verse from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. There is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to thank God for my wife, Peg. I want to thank God for my family. I want to thank God for the fact that this is the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And I thank God for that. And I want to thank God also for the fact that it's not just simply that we're going to be with him when we die. That's a given if you're a son and a child of God, daughter of God. But he's even given us life now that we can live for him here on this earth. I just simply be in heaven later on, which is a big deal. But the fact that he gives us now the opportunity on this earth to glorify him. That as we are here, we are to live in such a fashion, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And we can live in such a fashion to talk to other people about our Jesus and to bring them to the Savior as we glorify him. And I thank him for that. Um, I'd like to thank God for my brothers because throughout this whole virus, they're really, I can really depend on them. They're my best friends now, and I really thank God for that, because just a couple years ago, we couldn't even stay in a room together without fighting. And <laughs> now, like, I can depend on them for so much, and I really thank God for that. Out of Psalm 107. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast Lord love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. We're, we're thankful to God that he has redeemed every person who has placed his faith and trust in him. And it, it's such an amazing privilege just to be able to stand here and, and sing and lead and just know that we are in the presence of God as we're singing his praises right now. So why don't we stand? We've got two more songs before Pastor comes up. The first song we're going to do, uh, we introduced it two weeks ago. Yeah, you've heard it on the radio a lot, but uh, I, I'd invite you to um, sing along with us. Yeah. 
is the only name that is worthy. Lord, we come here and we confess that. We praise you. We thank you. We love you. Lord, I pray for Pastor that comes up and opens up your word. I just pray that his words will be your words. I pray that you speak through him and use him lightly this morning. Give your thanks and praise always in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. What the blank do you know about giving thanks? In 1987, I received probably the most violent, vulgar, poison pen letter I have ever received in my life. In November of 1986, I had published an article in Decision Magazine, the magazine of the Billy Graham Association, on the subject of Thanksgiving. And the next year, I think it was in the spring of 87, I received this letter from a Native American gentleman by the name of Great White Cloud, who had moved to Chicago. He and his family had left the reservation, had come to Chicago, hoping to find a better life. And after they arrived in Chicago, he lost his job, his brother was mugged, and his daughter was raped. And he wrote to me, what the blank do you know about giving thanks? Now, maybe your language is a little cleaner today, but maybe that's your sentiment today as we come to the uh, tail end of 2020. Maybe you're saying today, this has been the worst year of my life. It's cost me financially, maybe it's you've lost a job, maybe you've lost a loved one that they passed away this year and you couldn't really do the funeral the right way like you'd like to because of all the restrictions. Maybe as you think about Thanksgiving Day this next week and all the restrictions and what you can do and you can't do and where you can go and where you can't go and Maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, why should I be thankful? Why should I? Because it's been a horrible year. And on top of that, I got nothing to be thankful for. And, and maybe that's your sentiment this morning. Maybe, maybe you haven't said that out loud, but maybe that's what you're thinking. Why should I? And on top of that, what should I be thankful for? For the next few minutes, I want to turn our attention to Psalm 138. This is a Psalm of David written in the context of problems. And in this Psalm, David, I think, identifies the nature of thanksgiving. And he answers those two questions of why should I be thankful, and what should I be thankful for? So turn with me there, if you would, to Psalm 138. Listen as, as I read it, and then we will try to unpack this and get some ideas that we can put into practice in our lives, not just this week, but this afternoon as well. So Psalm 138 of David. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased." All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out my, your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. 
The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. As you look at this psalm, there's three movements in this psalm, verses 1 through 3, 4 through 6, and 7 through 8. And we know that because there's a change in subject or there's a change in pronoun. In 1 through 3, it's I will. In 4 through 6, it's they will. And in 7 and 8, it's you will. So there's three movements, if you will, three stanzas in this particular psalm, in this song. In verses 1 through 3, I think David presents the nature of thanksgiving. David identifies that true thanksgiving is more than simply saying, oh, thank you. It's much more than that. It's actually closer to the idea of praise. It's the idea of praising God for who he is and for what he's done. In 4 through 6, you see the idea that thanksgiving leads to worship. That when one person makes the choice to praise God, it inspires other people to join in. And it changes from thanksgiving and praise to worship, from personal praise to corporate worship. And then in the last stanza, you see that worship then leads to confidence. It's the idea that when we praise God for what he did in the past, when we remember, here's how God met my needs last week, last year, that gives us greater confidence to believe, hey, you know what? God could do that again. If God did that then, what could he do tomorrow? And so you see the idea that Thanksgiving is it's praising God for who he is and what he does, And thanksgiving then leads to worship. Personal praise leads to corporate worship. And then worship leads to greater confidence in who God is and what God can do. And you add all that together, you get the main idea of this psalm is that making the choice to praise God for who he is and for what he's done will not only encourage us individually, but it will inspire others to praise God. And it will increase our confidence in God. It will increase our ability to trust God for the future. When we make the choice to say, I will praise God, I will give thanks, it encourages other people to do the same. And it inspires us to trust God. Because if we say, man, look what God did. Look what God will do. As you see that transformation. So the first movement is in verses 1 through 3. And you see that true thanksgiving is a choice. There's a difference between feeling thankful and being thankful. There's a difference between feeling thankful and actually giving thanks. David starts out, he says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. As I said, there's a, there's a difference between feeling thankful and giving thanks. When, you know, the leaves are on the trees and it's fall and the colors are changing and it's beautiful, or when you come into to spring after a long gray winter and the flowers are starting to, to bud and the trees are blooming or your favorite team wins a championship, you think, oh man, I feel thankful. You know what? This is beautiful. Let's praise God. What a great day. And and you feel thankful. But when there's a pandemic, when there are protests in the streets, when you can't travel, you got to resort on a Zoom Thanksgiving because you can't have too many people in your house. I don't really feel thankful then. I don't like that. And that's where you have to make a choice. 
to give thanks. Look at the context of this psalm in verse 7, where David says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. Your right hand delivers me. Now, we don't know exactly when this psalm is written, but most commentators feel that it's written in the context of battle. It's not written on a sunny summer day where David is kicking back in the palace, he's got his feet up, he's got his favorite beverage, and says, man, what a great day, let's praise God. No, what David says is, I'm in the midst of trouble. And in the midst of trouble, you preserve me. You deliver me. My enemies are opposing me. And your right hand is right there. See, it's in the context of difficulty. It's in the context of opposition. It's in the context of saying, you know what? This day is terrible. And yet look what David does back in verse 1. I give thanks. I sing your praise. I bow down and give thanks. Nowhere in this psalm does David say, I feel thankful. What David does say is that I choose to give thanks regardless of the circumstances. Regardless of whether the day is sunny or gray, whether it's summer or winter or in between, whether I've got all my needs met or I'm going hungry, I give thanks. I sing your praise. See, true thanksgiving is a choice. There's a difference between feeling thankful and choosing to give thanks. Feeling thankful is dependent on your circumstances. But choosing to give thanks is independent of whatever is going on around us. Look at how David pours himself into his praise, into thanksgiving. He uses his voice. He sings praise. He uses his body. He says, I bow down. He pours his whole heart into it. I give you thanks with my whole heart. Not just what, you know, I'm not just paying lip service, but I'm pouring myself into it. There's a public element to it where he says, I do this before the so-called pagan gods. I bow down towards your holy temple. See, there's the public element because when David praises, people hear it and people see it. It's not something that, you know, he's just walking along, humming to himself and saying, yeah, you know, I praise God. But nobody knows. When David praises God, everybody knows because he pours himself into it And he uses his voice and his body and his whole heart is involved in praise. His praise is focused on who God is and what God does. What he says is, I give thanks to your name. In the Old Testament, God's name always reveals his character. Elohim tells us that he's the strong one, the creator. Jehovah Jireh tells us that God is the one, the Lord who will provide. And so he says, I give thanks to your name. He's talking about, I'm praising you for your character, for your attributes. I give thanks for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. That's his actions, what God does. For you have exalted above all things, another action. You've exalted your name and your word, another attribute. On the day I called, you answered. My strength of soul, you've increased. Again, another action. What David is saying is, I praise God for who he is 
and for what he does. I praise him for his attributes. I praise him for his actions, for his character, for his conduct, for his greatness, his grace, his majesty, his mercy. I praise God for who he is and for what he does. And so you add all that up together, and my definition of thanksgiving is true thanksgiving is more like praise. True thanksgiving is a public declaration of who God is and what God does. It is a public declaration of the attributes and the actions of God. True thanksgiving is telling other people, I praise God for, and I praise God why, so that other people hear it. To help me understand that, I came up with an acrostic using the word praise. The first three letters were relatively easy, and then it became a little bit of a stretch to finish it. But my definition of thanksgiving is publicly remembering the attributes and actions of the incomparable sovereign God of eternity. True thanksgiving is publicly telling other people, letting other people know, publicly remembering, publicly recounting, publicly retelling, Hey, you know what God did for me five years ago? You know what God did for me yesterday? You know how God answered prayer? Publicly remembering who God is, his character, his majesty, his mercy. Publicly remembering his greatness. Publicly remembering how God answers prayer how God pours out his grace to meet needs. And thinking about that God is incomparable. Who is like God? He's the sovereign God. He's the one who's in charge. He has a plan and a purpose. He's not bound by time. But true thanksgiving is publicly remembering the attributes and the actions of of the incomparable sovereign God of eternity. David goes on to say that thanksgiving then leads to worship, that personal praise leads to corporate worship. In verses 1 through 3, David says, I give thanks, I sing your praise, I bow down, I give thanks. One of the reasons why is because you answer prayer, verse 3. But now he changes from I will, I give thanks, to they will, in verses 4 through 6. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. The kings of the earth heard David's praise and joined in and said, yes. Man, you know, God God did that for David? Let me tell you what he did for me. And it's that idea that personal praise can lead to corporate worship. When you heard other people sharing their testimonies earlier, did that prompt you to think about, hey, what what did God do for me? Did, Did God do something similar? Did God do something different? Did it prompt you to think about what God did? See, it's that idea of a single voice praising God, a single voice singing a song of praise about God. And pretty soon a few other people join in. And then eventually you have a whole choir singing the praise. And that's the idea here where David starts out and says, I give thanks. And then it goes to all the kings of the earth will give thanks. That personal praise can lead to corporate worship. One person making the choice to praise God can inspire other people to do the same. The flip side of that is true too. One whiny person 
can discourage a whole group. But the flip side of that is also true, that one person who praises God can also change a group. That when we choose to give thanks, it inspires other people to join in. And one of the reasons that we can praise God is God doesn't judge by our standards. In verse 6, it says, Though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. We live in a culture that worships celebrities. The powerful, the rich, the influential. And God says, you know what? They're nothing. But the humble? Those are my kind of people. Those who choose to serve? Those are the ones I'm going to honor. When I was growing up, I had one brother. Uh, my brother Paul was 14 months older than me. He was six inches taller than me. And growing up, I always wanted to be Paul. And if Paul was in the band, I wanted to play an instrument. If Paul played basketball, I wanted to play as well. Because Paul was talented, he was musical, he was athletic, he was outgoing, he was everything that Mark wasn't. And it wasn't good enough to be Mark. And it wasn't until I was probably in college that I began to discover that God cared for me. And I discovered that it was okay to be Mark. I didn't have to be Paul that the God who created the universe cared about me. That though he was high and lifted up, he cared for the lowly. And that's one of the reasons why David praises God is because God's standards are completely different from ours. Thank God. That God looks at our heart not necessarily our performance, our appearance, our status. God doesn't judge by human standards. In the third stanza, you see the idea that true thanksgiving is praising God for who he is, for what he's done. Personal praise can lead to corporate worship, and worship will lead to, to increased confidence. And the more we understand and worship God, the more we'll be willing to trust him. David says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. Your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. There was a, a few years back where Carol and I decided we wanted to visit Niagara Falls. So we, you know, got out MapQuest. We printed out a map of, you know, how to get from here to there, identified all the road construction, the roadblocks, where things would slow down, you know, possible places we could stop, spend the night on the way, where we could you know, have dinner, you know, all those kind of things. God doesn't do that. God doesn't lay out the roadmap for the rest of 2020, let alone 2021 or 2025. God doesn't tell us what's around the next bend, whether it's going to be straight, twisty, paved, gravel, God doesn't tell us what's there. But what he does tell us is that he will be with us. He does tell us that he can be trusted. Verse 8 says that God will take care of my interests. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. God is sovereign. He has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And he will fulfill that purpose. And nothing is going to change that. 
And we can have that confidence that God is in control and that God will accomplish what concerns us. God will not forsake the work of his hands. It's the same thing that the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 1.6, that he who began a good work will complete it. And we need to know that because sometimes it seems like, you know, God's taken us into a cul-de-sac, a pothole, and how's God going to get out of this one? The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. He will not forsake the work of his hands. When any circumstance arises, we have two choices how we can respond. We can respond with thanksgiving, saying, I give thanks. Regardless of the circumstances, I give thanks. Thanksgiving will lead to worship. Thanksgiving will inspire others to join me in praising God. Worship, in turn, will lead to greater confidence. If I give thanks for what he did, for how he delivered me, I can be confident he's not going to forsake me now. Well, we also have a second choice how to respond. We can respond with ingratitude. Ingratitude says, I don't like what you're doing, God. I think I have a better idea. If I was in charge, I would. I'm not really sure you care. See, ingratitude leads to doubts. I'm not really sure God does have a plan. I'm not really sure God's in charge. I'm not really sure that God cares. And that, in turn, leads to despair. Because if God's not in charge, if God doesn't care, what hope is there? Why go on living? That's what you've seen played out over the last eight, nine, ten months, the increase in depression and suicide because people have lost hope. Because they're looking for hope in the wrong place. See, we need to respond by saying, God, regardless of my circumstances, I will give thanks. I will focus on who you are and what you're doing. And I will praise you for that and trust that you will accomplish your plan and purpose. And I would encourage you to do just that. If you have the sermon notes, there's a chart on the back of it. If you don't have them, then just get a scrap piece of paper. Make two columns. In one column, start making a list of who God is. Make a list of God's attributes. Start reading through the Old Testament. Read through the Psalms. Identify who God is. How does he identify himself? And then start making a list of what God does. Specifically, what what has God done in your life? So make a list of his attributes. Make a list of his actions. And then share that list with someone else. Make it public. Tell somebody else what you give thanks for. How you praise God for who he is. How you praise God for what he does. And make the choice to give thanks whether you feel like it or not. Whether it's a good day, a bad day, or in between, make the choice to give thanks, to praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are and for what you have done in our lives. Father, thank you for the many and varied good gifts that you give to us. And, Father, we praise you for that. Father, transform us. Help us to take our eyes off our circumstances 
and put them back on you. Lord, change our focus, change our mindset. Father, change our hearts. Make us people of praise. And we commit that to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we go, we have one item of church business to uh, conduct as well. We want to add someone to our fellowship, a Destiny LeBron. Is Destiny here? Don't see if she's here or not. Destiny uh, came to faith through the ministry of Jack and Simka Gilbert. They led her to Christ uh, earlier this year or late last year, I believe. I forget the timing. Destiny was baptized uh, way back in the spring during our one of our early totally virtual s- services. So you probably saw her testimony online. And uh, Stan Kulig and uh, Jack Gilbert and I met with her a couple of weeks ago to interview her. And so we are going to add her to our uh, membership this morning. So as an official aspect of church business, it comes from the elders as a motion. I need a second for that. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Why don't you stand with me? Let's uh, be dismissed with prayer today. Father, thanks uh, so much for who you are and for what you've done. We praise you for uh, Marshall, for Joyce, for being baptized, and we praise you for Destiny joining our fellowship as well. Father, continue to move in our lives. And we praise you for who you are and for what you've done. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.